Thank you for tuning in to Cop with Comic. I'm Brian Cop, wherever the comic, Nick Wolverski. Nick Wolverski, how the hell are you? I'm doing well, man. How about yourself? Yeah, I'm doing so great. Thank you so much. I, I mean, I know you're a big LA comedian, but now you're in Vermont. <laughs> oh yeah, monster, monster LA comedian. And you're gonna you're gonna bring that uh, the what's the fucking Brody Stevens energy out there? Even at a, yeah. before oh, we, yeah. we had we had prepod, we had you on video, <laughs> and you had a Brody Stevens shirt, and I was like, this guy's a comedy killer. Oh no, no I just love Brody, man. It's it, it was, I was trying to get the positive energy in me. It's weird to do the stuff from your own like room. You, know what I mean? <laughs> you got it. Like, you like got that. it. Like, you did, got did he, it. Yeah. Sell. I mean, because you saw him at the store a couple times, the comedy store. And did you, uh, did he have any merch that said you got it? And if not, why the fuck not? Uh, you know, I don't know if he has an I got it. I mean, this shirt I got, I, I actually got um, post mortem. Uh, you know, rest in peace. Yeah. But uh, I, I got it off his website. I think it was like BrodyStevens.com merch or something. Oh, good. Um, yeah, yeah. I did well, it. Uh, yeah, same that'll with help his estate. That'll help his mom because he was close to his right. mom, right? I hope she's yeah, exactly. Still yeah. There yeah. Go. Same. Yeah. And that uh, and that bench in Tarzana or wherever or or uh, Reseda, sorry. <laughs> did he really did he really have a bench in Reseda? Uh, after he passed away, yeah, they they had the um like a little pin that you could buy from um those like enamel pins, and it was donated to uh building a bench where he's from, um in in near the, like a park where he always used to play ball and stuff. So have, pretty you, cool. have you been there? I haven't. No, no, no. I mean, yeah. yeah. That's I bought a shirt. Sure. That's enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't need to go. And there. a pen. I bought a pen. <laughs> yeah, I don't need to go to receive it. Um, yeah. All right. So, so real yeah. quick, um, there's a lot of stuff to talk about. You also, well, first let's bring up the socials because you are. What the fuck? I clicked on your. I clicked on your photo. Yeah. So it's Wawerski is on Twitter, but yes, also um, on on Instagram, you were also Wawerski, and then Wawerski.com. You're kind of Wawerski across the board, but when they go to uh, Wawerski on Instagram, they see. That you're the proud pa of Iggs the Ham, and you click on this account, and Iggs the Ham <laughs> has thousands of followers, <laughs> thousands of followers, and most adorable dogs. Thank you. Yeah, I love my dogs so much. So uh, it's, Iggs Ang- it's Iggy and Angus. Mm-hmm. And it was the first just Iggs, and that's why it was Iggs the Ham. Correct. Yeah, yeah. We had Iggy first. Uh, I got her. I was bartending when I walked into work. A cook was just walked in was like hey does anybody need a dog and i was like dude i don't have the time or the month and before i could say money he showed me a photo of her and i was like ah shit i think i'm getting a dog <laughs> and then three years later you had angus i even see the dates you got him and so angus are they that let me because they look similar they're the same breed and like did you like the first one so much that you got the second breed kind of uh on purpose yeah 100 percent. yeah they're both uh australian cattle dog mixes which i had never heard of until we mixed got with Iggy. what they're both the same mix um, no, they're both. It's crazy. Iggy is uh, like mostly sh- uh, Australian cattle dog. I think she's 50 percent. We did the DNA thing because okay. I'm a white person with too much time and money. Um, and so she's like 50 percent Australian cattle dog. I want uh, like a third Kelpie, which is another Australian uh, herding breed. The ones that like run across the back of sheep rather than going under them. Really cool. Uh, and then Yorkie. She's like like <laughs> like 10 percent or 15 percent Yorkie or something. Uh, the Yorkie color. But I mean, yeah. uh, the cattle dogs are different colors than this, right? Uh, they have they have red or blue. Like you okay. can be a red, a red healer or a blue healer. Okay. Uh, the blue are kind of gray with the you know the the blackish spot. The the red healer is closer to Iggy. You're right in that neither really look like true cattle dogs, but wow, Iggy, I can't, I can't Iggy, Iggy got, looks more like a kelpie. Yeah, that is so cool that you got just. I mean, both mixes and they're both just. Uh, you just love them both equally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What's I the, mean, what's I, the temperament? Like, what's the temperament that like this dog? You just fell in love with this dog, and and the fact that the dogs could have such a following on Instagram. Kind of, what's the secret to their success, and how do you make sure that your own account is as popular? <laughs> Jeez, I don't know, man. <laughs> I guess I, if you want to be a successful comic, be a cute dog. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I it, well, we started it. So I used to work in TV production, and the reason I started doing that account was because my wife and I were just like, oh, it'd be kind of fun. Yeah. If we could ever get her to do like an Alpo ad and pay off my student loans through just training my dog, like no joke, that's kind of how it started. Because okay. <laughs> because uh, she's brilliant. I, I had no idea how smart these dogs could be. Australian cattle dogs are wildly intelligent. They're one of the few breeds um, that I know of, at least uh, dogs that were specifically bred to think for themselves. Uh-huh. Most most dogs are are bred to like listen and obey, and cattle cattle dogs are really taught to like understand what the humans want and then to go do it themselves oh um, fuck and then how does that sometimes yeah. work against you because the dog is kind of all the time all the time 
They're they're so brilliant. It's such a pain in the ass, but they're so. But it's not like it's very. It's like having just like a cheeky roommate. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, I guess is how I describe it. If I was suddenly British, but uh, they're just. <laughs> There's so much fun and like so brilliant. My Iggy knows. I mean, actually now at this point, they, they're they both pretty similar. Iggy and Angus both know probably 70, 80 commands. They can bring me a bottle of water on command. Well, like I can hand her almost anything that they can mouth, like comfortably feel in their mouth and bring it to my wife wherever she is. So I can just like go bring this to mama and she'll. Oh, my Lord. I mean, it has yeah. you, have you kind of made that? Um, I mean, do you still have student loans? I mean, did you get the alcohol, <laughs> alcohol ad yet? No, 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 no. Uh, like COVID hit and then I just stopped with the account because, you know, it just seemed ridiculous to keep making an Instagram account about my dog. Oh, no, was, we, like, we need it more than ever, man. Are you serious? You haven't yeah. posted in a while? No, I don't think I posted in, God, maybe a year or 84 two. weeks. What the fuck? No, nah, man, this is the only thing people should be posting during <laughs> COVID. <laughs> yeah, you're not wrong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. tell me, like, yeah, one, of the, one of the topics that I love that you proposed is the importance of play in life. Like, mm. you, you talked about training your two dogs, but the important, like, have you yeah. observed anything about the way dogs play that you've kind of tried to mimic in your own life to make sure that you and your girlfriend or whatever are just, you know, enjoying life as much as, uh, as Iggy and Angus? Oh yeah, it's constant. I mean, the the play is, um, it, it's something I it brought back. Bat, what was that? Uh, it was brought back out of me by my dogs. Like it was something that, like, I feel like you know, being an adult and going to school and shit was like beaten out of me almost. Okay. <laughs> and then just being around a dog, you just look at them constantly. Like if you're paying attention to them, I think most animals. If you learn to listen to them and not speak to them, like I think most people think animal training is like talking to a dog and it's not, it's understanding like what they're doing. That way you can communicate back <sighs> and, and they are constantly playful, like always. And it's just the part of like, why aren't we like that more? Like, why isn't life, why aren't you skipping down the road on occasion? Yeah. You know, like, why, why am not? I so sad? Cause you were in, you were in yeah. uh, LA for what, seven years doing comedy probably. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or, or I mean a long time. And so the question is like, were you becoming too self-serious about your career? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's, it made me on stage just be the guy that was just standing there and trying to like, you know, I don't know, preach, <laughs> which is exactly <laughs> what comedy's not. Oh, I love you know that. I mean? That's what I want in a oh, comic. Like worst. Oh. Yeah, yeah, right. See Nick Wabersky. Oh, he taught me a thing or two. I mean, I didn't laugh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, I didn't laugh once. But oh man, do I feel bad about my past? Yeah, it's like that's not what you're going for, man. God, God, like, isn't that what everyone else is going for? Aren't we supposed to be the ones up there that's like, oh man, these guys suck. Yeah, but I mean, so do you think that that kind of freed you up then? To be a little bit less self-serious about your career like first of all that might be the reason yes. why you like brody stevens because he had comes out and has fun and plays plays with the notion that he can do whatever the fuck he wants but is that one of the reasons why you're in vermont right now because you feel dude life's too short to be like i need to be in a particular city to succeed exactly i mean you're nailing it man like <laughs> you you know as far as therapy sessions go this is a my first <laughs> and probably best uh but yeah <laughs> uh yeah that's exactly it i mean the way I was able to become more playful, honestly, was getting over the embarrassment of playing with my dog in a dog park. Because, like, I used to go to a dog park in L.A. Um, called the Boneyard in, like, Culver City. And everyone That's would be on their phones. They'd, like, just let their dogs out. And then the dogs would just all go to a corner and lay down because they're, like, what are – like, they just mimic what the – people are doing and the, peop and the people aren't socializing so the dogs don't socialize and then one day i was there and i just saw a guy just like rolling on the ground with his dog and i was like why am i not that guy right now you know what i mean i was like that's that guy is a hundred percent correct like he yeah. looked insane from a distance until you just thought about it for four seconds and then you're like yeah why are you not on the ground playing with your dog right now yeah that's what's, what well, what's, the, yeah, that's what's what the equivalent want. yeah what's the equivalent like when we see you in vermont you know, and tell me about the big club up there and the scene up there. But just, you know, when we see you up there in Vermont, you know, headlining whatever club you're at, like, what is the equivalent of rolling around on the ground with your dog? Oh, man, I guess I well, so I go to the Vermont Comedy Club, which is in Burlington. Uh, it's like a, an amazing scene. It's one of the reasons that it's brought it's rejuvenated my love for comedy. Not that I really lost it, but I mean, it added to it incredibly over COVID. Um, cause it's just a scene of people that are all just having fun. It's yeah. all, pe everyone up there is just trying stuff. I mean, failing as well, but you know what I mean? But they're, they're trying stuff and it's people that are like, I don't know, maybe I could use one music cue or, you know what I mean? Just for like three seconds or just like yeah. a quick thing or like, let's do this or let's try that. Or maybe I'll put on a hat or, you know what I mean? I, not that it's like a prop comedy genre or anything. I just mean that it's just people trying. And a lot of people in Los Angeles just seem to be 
uh, too stuck on the straight and narrow to try and get the right path or whatever. And you're like, that's not the fun way. That's, you know. Yeah, that's kind of stupid, too, because you would think that in L.A., I would think there'd just be tons of act outs and shit like that. Mm, but it's more, yeah. oh, they find their one thing and they do that thing. And it's like they can't put on a different hat, even exactly. though doing so could lead to more discovery. Like you could find 15 yep. additional characters if you played a little bit on stage. Yeah. Yeah. And I think uh, for me, like a big part of it is the difference, I think, is kind of uh, cultural, not even comedy related, is the difference. I've been thinking about it more and more, especially New. I'm going to comp- compare New England to LA. So when I say like East Coast, West Coast, that's what I mean. Okay. Um, and I think it's because here, the we have an outside enemy. Like you need an outside enemy in life in order to get along. And our outside enemy is the weather. Like it's you know what I mean. There's snow. Uh... It's constantly fucking us. And like you show up late to work, you have to shovel your car out. You have to you know you have to clear <laughs> your car. You have to warm your car. You have to get to work. Yeah. You have to do all these things just to go to a thing you don't want to go to. Yeah. So but by, by the time you're there, when you see another human being, you're like, yo, this <laughs> sucks. But you're cool, right? Yes. Yeah, and it, oh, that's yeah, cool. So it helps not yeah. only with the acts but also the audiences. They're right. ready to have. Fun. Yeah, and in LA, everyone, the only outside enemy is other people because it's traffic. It's just people stopping you from getting to what you're trying to go to. So you start to hate other people, yeah. even though it's not, it's not really them. Do you know what I mean? It's just, it's, and so it's very, um, it all of a sudden becomes very confrontational in a land of art, which is crazy. <laughs> like, I love Los Angeles. Don't get me wrong. I'm not, I, it, it's the ugliest city I've ever loved, but yeah, yeah, it looks, uh, yeah, it looks, a little, it looks like strip mall separated by traffic. Yeah, exactly. Which is the but, ugliest thing I can but, think of. Exactly. It is absolutely the ugliest thing <laughs> visually. But then yeah. you meet people yeah. and everyone you meet has this dream and they're chasing it. And yeah, if, cool. if you tell them yours and vice versa, they're like, cool, man, do it. And like that part is amazing. You say, and then oh, they quit. Then, yeah. then they get all serious on stage. They're right. Like, yeah. Yeah. I exactly, can't, I can't yeah. try anything new. I can't put on the stupid. Yeah. I can't put on my uh, Brody Stevens t shirt. Right, yeah. And then on the East Coast, you tell somebody your dream and they're like, all right, moron, get a job. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so it's, it's very, it's like, it's, you got to be in the middle. Uh, you know, but in, but in Vermont, 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 it's like, all right, like, um, but but then, you know, so let's say you found the place, you found the scene, you're like, this is cool, it's going to allow me to stretch, it's going to give me stage time, it's going to, uh, I'll be, I'll feel free to kind of um, try anything on stage with the 10, 20 minutes I get. But then you're kind of spoiled, right? Because then you go to other places and the, the enemy is not the weather. You know, they, your, your enemy is there's 50,000, you know, you go to New York, yeah. there's 50,000 other things to do that. Right. Night, oh, yeah. Or you go oh, down yeah. to Atlanta and there is traffic or whatever. So how do you, not, you know, how do you take advantage of it without getting spoiled by it? Um, I, I think for me, I, I've, I come from an athletic background. Like I was a D1 athlete. I was a uh, javelin thrower and I, I, uh, other crap. Um, and so I approach it kind of athletically in so much as a lot of the time I'm on stage, especially like, let's say an open mic at the, at the Vermont comedy club, which is amazing. You get in LA, you go to an open mic. There's like six people that are all comics that have all heard your jokes and, and four of them hate you. Uh, (laughs) you You're doing better than they are. Right. Or worse, or they just don't like your face. And, and like in the Vermont comedy club, like it'll be like 80 people at an open mic, which is mind blowing to me after six, six years in LA where you're like, wait, what? There's, People here have never even seen comedy. And they're excited to see me just because I'm on stage. You know, you're gonna put me in front of this live audience. Are you kidding me? You're gonna yeah. let me do this? this and so pretty, you're not gonna give me the training wheels. You're not gonna what? Yeah, make sure yeah, that I've yeah, headlined yeah. Leno before you before you let me in front of this right. live audience. Yeah, exactly. Uh, oh, Leno. I worked at the from uh, the Comedy Magic Club and used to be the sound guy and hand Leno his tape. He always said grazie, and it still pisses me off because it's like the only word he knows for thanks. Anyway, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but. Uh, so yeah, at the, at the what I think you should do is don't just approach sets as like everyone approaches them seemingly, in my opinion, as like a writing exercise. But there's so many other things you should be working on. You should be working on um, your movement, your your eye contact, your your um, your like volumetric rises and lowers in your voice, the 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 Dynamic, intonation the, of your tone. Yeah, all these other things. And so I often will give myself literally kind of like a, a assignment where I say, okay, if you go on stage for, for a long time, I was like everybody, like terrified to look anybody in the eye while I was saying anything, especially like, uh, you know, a swear word or a punchline that was kind of harsh. Uh, so I'll just say, okay, like this whole set, the whole set goal is to just, when you say this one punchline, really sell it to one person's eyes, like into their soul. Sorry wow. for that one person, by the way. But, uh, <laughs> but you know this what I mean? Is, like, yeah, this is more for me. This is more for me than you. That's right. Yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. you, it's me. 
I have yeah. to do this. <laughs> so I think it's important to do those things. So you can give yourself assignments that aren't necessarily like it's not the writing, it's not even the audience response, it's the craft, it's the working on the skill set. Like if you're going to play in the NBA, dude, you got to be able to dribble, you got to be able to shoot, you got to do all these other things. It's not that you just play basketball. Like that's not a thing. You know what I mean? It's like there's all yeah. these individual skills. Like I've been watching the Celtics and it's just like fuck, dude. <laughs> yeah. It's like there's so many things they should be doing correctly and are not. And it's like you're right. It's yep. like a series of skills. And so that's what you'll be able to kind of work out right. at the Vermont Comedy Club. And so then, like, then you're free to hop in the car and go to Connecticut mm-hmm. and hop in the car and go to Boston or New York and, and make sure you're getting with, yeah. <laughs> but getting a diversity <laughs> of audience, getting a diversity of audiences or whatever. Yeah, I'm just kidding. My mom's from born and raised in Hartford or uh, New Haven. So sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that, mom. But yeah, so yeah <laughs> the same thing. Like, like I did, um, you know, I did stand up just like the first, op- the first and only open mic in in Chicago. Mm-hmm. Had I had an audience full of people. It was that you know Cubby Bear across from Wrigley Field, and I just killed. It was amazing. Mm-hmm. And then you move to New York City, and you do four open mics in Greenwich Village, and it's all yeah. the comic comedians just waiting for their turn to get up. And I was like, no. Yeah. I can't. I'd rather. Like, I'd rather interview the people. <laughs> yeah. yeah <laughs> or the funny. Sure. I, yeah. It's like I would yeah. rather sh- do the shooting this shit with all the comedians. Exactly. And, I mean, that's, that's part never, of comedy. Yeah. Never like go to fifteen open mics a night like some of these people yeah. are trying. Well, and especially because there's 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 this falsified like view of what you're supposed to be doing, and it's not like the whole point is to get paid for being fun. Yeah. And you know what I mean? <laughs> like I said, like, go be funny on stage. Whatever that means to you, whatever, you know, you want to make fun of politics, you want to make fun of clowns, you want to make fun of saxophones, whatever, like go do a thing, make people laugh, and then hopefully collect a check and not have to get a real job. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's the fucking plan. So, I mean, how do you, um, you know, how do you make sure you're doing it from Vermont? I mean, I know you're developing mm-hmm. every single skill that you should, but like, how are you making sure, like, you know, are they going to pay, you know, they're not going to pay you every night of the week right. oh, to, yeah, yeah. to be in front of 80 people or whatever it is. Like, how do you? You know, how do you make sure that you're, you know, you're going from Vermont to making sure you're, you know, you're getting paid to do comedy instead of a day job? Like, you, I guess that's the goal that everybody has, but the delusion for some, you know, probably some people in LA are like, oh, if I just keep being self-serious on stage yeah, right. and not paying attention to my fellow comedians, <laughs> that, oh, if I don't laugh at their jokes, uh, they nobody will think they're funny and somehow I'll get the time. <laughs> like, like, like they got the delusion. Oh, man, like like so some true. people are not like, of yeah. course, the people I talked to today are all just fucking hustling, doing 45 different things to make sure mm-hmm. that they catch the right eye or just because yeah. they love to do it. But right. like, you know, the old what? Nick, Nick Lewerski is like, I'm being self-serious and somehow this is making me, this is getting me to the next level where I'm getting paid, paid to do comedy every night of the week. Yeah. I, I, for, so for, t- to me, it's like twofold. Like one, I, it's uh, who, I don't know who the original quote was. I think it's Barry Katz, but I bet it was somebody else because he seemed like the guy that probably stole it. But he always <laughs> he always said uh, be undeniable, which yeah. is like just be so funny that like you can't not be booked. That's period. And then beyond that, I'm working on a podcast that I want to do. That's based yeah. Tell me about it's got a cool. Yeah. What was the name of that thing? I love it. Oh yeah, it's a uh, bacon. The bacon stretcher. Yeah, what the um, fuck is that? <laughs> so if you've ever worked in restaurants, uh, a bacon stretcher is just like a fool's errand. It's just something like if a new person's hired, like some <laughs> new kid, you're like, oh, could you go to the kitchen and grab me the bacon stretcher? Yeah. And then, when, and then when that kid goes to the kitchen, the kitchen's going to send him across the street to another restaurant. And that restaurant's going to send him yeah. to another restaurant. Do they and really then, do that with bacon stretcher or just things in general? Oh, did yeah. You make up, did you make up bacon stretcher? No, 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 no. That's 100% a thing. Bacon stretcher, wow. uh, a left-handed corkscrew, a strawberry mallet, um, a bucket of steam. I mean, there's like a that, million. Those yeah. sound certainly plausible. Like, that's what exactly. I love about it. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's, you it's, should stretch out bacon, right? Right. I mean, it starts, yeah, exactly. it starts yeah. crinkling up. <laughs> so it's it's just like a it's a dumb in joke to like see if you're fun and like if you're fun. Like we at one time I was working in Burlington, and we sent this kid, and I forgot, and I'm not even kidding. Four hours later, he came back from he had hit almost every restaurant in town because every restaurant had sent him around, and he just kept going to them. And and he told the whole story, and I checked, and all these people were like, yeah, no, he was in here. So he didn't just, like, go home and make it up. Four hours we got out of him. And, and so like, he, ne- he just never found it. He didn't, it'd be great oh, if he came back yeah. with something. Oh, so yeah. Thought, I, you I, could take these two clamps and, like, you know, stretch out the bacon that way. I would have made a mayor. No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but <you're, laughs> but a cool thing, like, I think you're going to interview service workers, which is great, because there was a, one of the funnier people to do that material is Kimberly DeNaro or De Niro, mm-hmm. and she's Brooklyn, and, like, she just, like, she she i don't know why she does but like 
she loves the profession like she's a bartender or something like that she loves it but she just like she does these super detailed like mocking every single like oh, yeah. what customer orders or customer tipping or whatever the fuck yep. it is and she working in a song <laughs> sometimes and it's great so you're gonna have people like that on yeah exactly yeah i mean i've worked so i've worked in restaurants for 20 years plus i, I was a bartender for i think uh uh 15. Um, my wife has worked 20 years plus. I have four older sisters that have worked 20 years plus. Both my parents were 20 years plus bartenders. So it's like it's such a, a staple part of my life. I grew up in bars and they mean so much to me. And I kind of hate the attack towards restaurants and stuff where it's like, dude, we signed the Declaration of Independence in like a tavern. Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like <laughs> that sort of thing. Like, do you have any idea how important these go back historically? Yeah. And to just and don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm not saying like alcoholism and beating up your wife is fine. That's not what right. I'm saying. I'm just saying, but like the bars, bar culture and that stuff is so important. And so I just want to interview bartenders, bar workers, bar patrons, kind so of. It's anyone. not necessarily going to be comedians. It's just going to be people no, who have funny honestly, stories because you don't need to be a comedian I don't to want have comedians. 45 funny honestly. stories, right? Yeah. I mean, comedians all they save their best stuff on stage. Like the funniest <laughs> things that I've ever been told were by a bartender at four in the morning when it was just them and I, you know, having a drink. And then they're like, oh, did I ever tell you about the time that this guy spit in my face and blah, blah, blah. And you're like, wait, what? <laughs> like, those are the best stories I've ever heard, period. Because oh, they're that. not to be told to a groups, you know what I mean? And so I'm I'm hoping to find, I know too many people with too many good stories that don't need to die. Yeah. The, story, the stories, I mean, not the people. I mean, some of them need to die. But. <laughs> <laughs> During COVID, yeah, they, they, the service workers uh, should not be dying for that shit. But I love the fact that you're going to, I mean, that's currency, man. If you can get a normal, per, I think we were talking about, I was talking to Kirsten Porter about that. I was like, oh, I got that from a normal person. We're like, oh, you know, got to credit that then, right? Yeah, like, exactly. As a joke. But like when it's, I mean, the currency of just like somebody, you know, somebody wanting to tell a true story, yeah. and, you know, just being like, you'll put that on my podcast because everybody's going to listen to that and enjoy it. <laughs> like yeah, Vegas Stretch is going to be huge, right? Comics can be so arrogant thinking that they're the only ones that have a story, you know, <laughs> it's yeah. like it's, we all do. Some people are great at telling it with their hands and they build you a brick wall and you're like, oh, man, that's that guy's been hurt because you can see the beauty <laughs> through his yeah. hand. You know what I mean? So it's like we, everyone does it differently, but. Bartenders are just another group of people that I think are fantastic storytellers that um, aren't showcased ever. And like, honestly, a big part of it for me is I'd love to showcase the bars they've worked at or whatever bars they love. Yeah. I want to I ask them the ridiculous questions. They're like, you know, what's the dumbest thing a, a patron's ever asked you for? What's the dumbest thing a, a, a bar owner's ever made you do? Like, what's, you know what I mean? Like, what's the most dehumanizing thing someone's ever said to you? Because like, I've heard I'd, so many of these stories that I don't think people even realize. I, I was working one time at a at a restaurant up in in Burlington, and this uh, server was working. Uh, like she was working on her master's in education, and uh, had like eight, um, had an eight top, and then like another like fourteen table section, and went up to this two top where there was a guy and his daughter, and he, she went up. She's so busy and was like just trying to get the order in and whatever you know keep rotating, and he just asks her out of the blue what the capital of some state was like, I don't remember. <laughs> and she goes, uh, I'm sorry. I don't know because like, it's not important at the moment. And yeah. then he looks at his daughter who's like seven and goes, yeah. see honey, that's why she's a waitress. No, the it's cra crazy, right? Like the that's devil. insane. Like what dude? And so, you know what I mean? Like moments like that, that, you know, if you've worked in service or whatever, you absolutely know that story is true. But if you haven't, you're like, what? People don't treat people like that. You're like, Oh, what? <laughs> You're not uh, seeing I, world star? Like, come on. <laughs> but I, I like that you're getting it from real people because then people will believe the story. It's just like sometimes some of the stuff is too true to even be funny on stage. Uh, yeah, some I, people are like, I don't believe that happened. Yeah, 100%. You know, like, you, you know, if a comic tells you some story and it's, too, you know, it's like, no, this actually just fucking happened. It's like, yeah, I don't believe you. You're just doing it for laughs. But exactly. to have real people do it, I love it. And it's just, it's, I've seen a lot of it in my feed because of the whole New York mayor thing where he's, you know, mm. kind of denigrating service workers and stuff. And so, of course, yeah. the comedians, you know, the former guests are rising up because some of them, you know, have, you know, other gigs and stuff. But, um, but it's so cool. I think it's going to be huge. And I really think like, you know, you. as long yeah, as long as you're developing your chops, you know, making sure you're, uh, you know, the sweaty gym that is Vermont Comedy Club for, you know, they call it the sweaty gym, but usually they're referring yeah. to whatever club they feel comfortable in and they're able to yeah. work out and for you, the Vermont Comedy Club. And so, um, but I think, yeah, I think, I think Bacon Stretcher is going to be fucking huge because you, know, you, you speak well, you're funny, but also like that is just the currency. These true Thank life you, yeah. stories that everybody yeah. want to hear. I think it's like, so untapped. It's such like a, 
and it's honestly i want to hear them like i'm doing it so selfishly do you yes. know what i mean it's like the idea that i could even make any money theoretically yes. in the future of hearing stories i already want to hear is just like oh man can this be a thing because that would be amazing <laughs> but, but i fucking love it because you hit you hit the nail on the head because right right now i'm doing that like i'm doing that with nick wolverski <laughs> You know, like, like I am like, this is totally selfish for me. Like I love doing it. And so I'm so happy to chat with Nick Wolverski. We follow him everywhere. He's just uh, pretty much he's known by Wolverski everywhere. Like he's so fucking famous. He's got one name. So Nick Wolverski, <laughs> thank you so much. My, my love to Ig Iggy and Angus. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. It was wonderful talking to you. Honestly, if you ever want to do it again and not record it, anytime. <laughs>